Good afternoon. Okay. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. It is indeed a good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chet Hewitt, and I want to welcome you uh, here today on behalf of PPIC's Board of Directors. PPIC is pleased to present this program today featuring California State Treasurer John Chung. Thank you for being here today. Yeah. The event is part of PPIC's 2018 Speaker Series on California's Future. We'd like to thank the sponsors of this series for their underwriting support. These organizations are listed on the screen to my left and on the back of your programs. This series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle, which are groups of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Funding from our sponsors and donors make programs like today's possible and ensures that they are free and open to the public in person and online. As part of the speaker series, PPIC is inviting all major candidates for governor to participate in a public event. The purpose is to give Californians a better understanding of how the candidates intend to address the challenges facing our great state. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. PPIC is always trying to improve our events, so later today you'll receive an email. It is a short email. It is a survey, and we ask that you take a few minutes uh, to complete it to let us know how we have done. And then second, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phones. With that, I will turn it over to the PPIC's president and CEO, Mark Baldessari. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chet. Thanks for the, the, the introduction. And to all of you who are here today or listening online or watching online, um, welcome to PPIC. It's a um, pleasure to see you all here. Um, I'm very pleased to have um, as our uh, special featured speaker today, uh, John Chung who, as you all know, is running for governor this year. And um, I just want to say a few things about uh, John's background, um, because he has such a unique resume. Um, for the past 20 years, he has held um, the top positions in uh, public finance and state government uh, at the Board of Equalization. And then he was elected um, controller in 2006, and again re-elected in 2010, um, and elected as treasurer in 2014. And he's uh, decided to run for governor. He could, um, he's not termed out as treasurer, could be running another term. Uh, there, uh, you know, if, if you are watching the elections, you'll notice when a lot of times when people are term, termed out, they'll look for the next job. But in John's case, he's, um, yeah, He's running for governor. So we, uh, we want to learn here today from John about his, uh, his leadership style and his vision and what's, what's brought him to this point. Um, and just let me ask all of you, uh, how many of you will be voting in the June 5th primary? Oh, OK, good. That's a good sign. Should ask the other question, who's not voting? That's right. <laughs> Well, John, you could be a good pollster. That's a good <laughs> um, and that's only four months away. So um, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, another question, which is, uh, how many of you haven't made up your mind yet who you're going to vote for for governor? Ah, OK. So there's, there's the informal poll today, John. Um, and I would put, I'd raise my hand for both of those. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, this conversation today. We agreed in advance we'd start with uh, a very broad question, and then we'll go in various directions. But um, I'd like to hear from you what you think are the top three issues that will be the ones that make the most difference for California's future. Well, my, my deep-seated passion is a reflection of my life experience. I think all of this is our mm -hmm. life experience. Uh, so mine is education. Uh, my parents were immigrants who came to this country. And, the aspiration of uh, America being the very best place to get the best education. So 
they gave it all. They came in separately in the 1950s. Uh, my dad, three shirts, two pairs of pants, not much money uh, in his pockets. Worked really hard. English was his fifth language. Got his PhD. Uh, my mom, you know, scrub floors, uh, learned uh, English. Uh, and so we want to make sure that California throughout in every single community uh, provides its children. And the, I'm not blessed with my own biological children, but I am blessed with eight godchildren. So mm -hmm. Latina, biracial, Asian American, right? The, California, uh, what they get, and I want them to have the very best. Uh, housing, we know that, you know, part of the, all of our dreams in the past is that white picket fence, you know. We know so many diverse and different areas, uh, born in Manhattan, so you, right, you have the skyscrapers, so whatever people want to call their home, and we know that we have a extraordinary crisis in California, right? When you add transportation, utility, housing costs, one of every five of us lives in poverty. You have extraordinary wealth inequality, right? We have to close that gap. And then, uh, you know, the uh, jobs, climate change, healthcare, right? The things that are absolutely critical in every, everybody's life. So those are, that will be the central focus, right? Because if you do that right, right, you, uh, you will have people who can live aspirationally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, well, let's start with education. Uh, before, um, before our event today, I was uh, reviewing one of our um, uh, researchers' proposals on closing the achievement gap. Um, the researcher who's here will know which one I'm talking about. We, in California, we, we uh, have, uh, we have racial disparities. And we have disparities uh, based on income, based on language, and uh, educational outcomes. And some people uh, have really benefited from the public education system, and some people have not. And uh, the current governor is, has worked uh, hard to look at different ways to fund uh, programs uh, that might provide more resources for those who have been left behind mm -hmm. in our educational system. And I think we'd all like to hear from you about what, what you would do that might be different, what you might do that might be the same as the current governor in terms of education and reducing the disparities that exist in our education system. Yeah, Mark, I thought you brought up a very powerful point on, on the disparities, whether it's income, whether it's uh, ethnic, whether it's heritage. Uh, you, you, look, you have to look no further than San Francisco, right? Desegregation efforts, right? The court lifting. Uh, those orders, uh, but here it's just incredibly segregated. Uh, you know, there's comments been made by others that, you know, this for an urban area, this is very high achieving, right? But it, you have incredibly disparity, right? The, you have a growing mix of Asians and Latinos in the public schools and declining Caucasians and African Americans, right? The African Americans have been profoundly dislocated from San Francisco communities, right? You look at the Fillmore District, the former you know, Harlem of the West Coast, and it's been gentrified. Uh, so many other communities. I was at the San Francisco Democratic Central Committee. We were listening to an hour of uh, community residents talking about the lack of housing, right? And it has an impact to community and what you have in regards to access to education. Uh, and so, right, as borne out, uh, if you're wealthy in San Francisco, uh, you're going to perform very well. If you're low income, you're not going to perform very well. We have to, I think, uh, Governor Brown uh, is focused correctly uh, in making sure that we address and put more resources into uh, school districts that have a heavy concentration of students who qualify for free or reduced lunches, uh, foster care kids, uh, kids with uh, disabilities. Uh, and frankly, if I was governor, I would change some of the funding formulas, right? Because what would you do? Uh, uh, we need okay. to make sure that we put additional resources in to take care of the kids with special needs, hmm. right? Because the traditional public schools are being born with that obligation, right? As people move to charter schools, they move to other schools. Uh, those who have greater needs are being left behind. Uh, and we need that integration, right? It's down the street in Stanford, they talk about, you know, the people that you have access at impact your uh, opportunities for information. Uh, what we've had with this gentrification, unfortunately, is like earlier generations of America were more integrated, especially economically, 
right? So when you had people of high wealth, mid medium wealth, and low income engaging with each other, they saw that ladder of opportunity. They would share the obligations. There was that sense of community, right? And it's been this, it's been disintegrating, uh, uh, unfortunately, here in the United States of America, right? So my background, my work has always been about investing in communities, hmm. right? Helping small businesses climb the ladder, making sure that I was, I think, I believe the first state elected official to provide free income taxes, right? Because we have too many people that struggle that, you know, need the best financial information, right? There's a disparity in regards to opportunity between those who are wealthy and those who have less financial resources, right? So mine would be strong community investments. And then part of it is, uh, you know, my background in the financial offices. I'm heavy into accountability, hmm. right? You know, all of you in this room, you know, fork over a good chunk of change to the state, and you want to make sure it's used wisely. I was the most successful auditor in California history by number. I did $9.5 billion in audit findings as the state controller. Uh, the previous uh, con successful controller did $2.5 billion in findings, right? We have to go into school districts and making sure that kids are achieving, right? Kids need to achieve, right? And I wanted to make sure that we build school site leadership, the parents' involvement, right? The number one factor outside of the classroom is parental involvement. Right? We need to make sure that teachers are well-supported, right? Well-trained, well-led, well-supported. And I believe in evidence-based practices, right? I would push for making sure that more of our schools of education, right? We do longitudinal studies to see what they're being taught in school is actually effective in the classroom. Getting the school employees, the principals, and everybody else, making sure that uh, they're supporting each other so that child is achieving. So if, uh, if we're more successful um, at um, reducing the achievement gap, um, that means that uh, there will be more um, students who are ready to go to college. And that's what we hope because, uh, again, PPIC research shows that if you look out to 2030, we expect that we're going to be over a million short of college graduates for what the economy is going to need. Uh, but today, um, students are being, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not able to get into the UC system or they're not able to get into the Cal State system. Um, and they're not able to achieve what, uh, what they want, what their parents want in terms of, um, of their dreams of college education. And I'm wondering how you would, uh, yeah, you would deal with those, those issues of access, particularly when, um, you know, some of our systems uh, aren't providing the kind of uh, outcomes that they could in terms of graduating students. Yeah, so uh, actually we have to start early on. Uh, so we, we know those uh, neural connections are developing in a child's, a, a baby's mind five to six days, you know, into birth. Uh, so, right, I would be aggressively pushing. It's my top priori priority is early childhood education along with child care, right, because parents shouldn't have to make a choice between a paycheck and their child, uh, right? We have to make sure that this entire system works together uh, because, frankly, we wouldn't be having a conversation about higher education or, you know, K through 12 if uh, they're, they've fallen behind even bef before they get to K. Uh, and so that would be my investment. Uh, and then... What I wanted to do is make sure that we get financial counselors and other counselors, counselors involved early on in the children's future along with parents, right? Because you have to plan for their financial trajectory. So along with academic education and something we need more investment in, the psychological side, side of a child, right? A lot of our schools are focused, focused on cognitive development, but not psychological development, right? We need a holistic approach to our education and also what I mentioned, the financial, right? Because children will choose different pathways. Uh, when my brother, who today is a doctor, took high school, I didn't choose some of those things, right? Obviously, he took college prep, but he also took woodworking and uh, electrical, right? So he brought home lamps and a whole bunch of other things, right? We want a wide platform for students to choose, right? And so if they want to take a pathway after high school, uh, they can go, you know, take an apprenticeship training program, uh, do some, take some great manufacturing job. Then we have to continue to build, getting to your point, right? We need to continue to build bridges, right? So you want that high school to community college, that high school to a four-year graduate program, communities investing in each other. So, right, you can partner, right? Can you take some high school classes affiliated with community college degrees so that you're getting, uh, 
that credit, right, which will have an economic benefit to that child and that particular family. And then we need to make sure that we have uh, all-inclusive programs. Uh, for instance, uh, USC uh, has a school uh, that they're affiliated with, and they partner with USC. They partner with some private sector participants, businesses. Right? So you build that mentorship. So uh, in regards to that, that's a holistic approach that I want to take. But then you need leadership who understands the state's finances, right? because we have to pay for this. Uh, so how do we pay for it? Uh, right, I bring a whole, whole different approach uh, to all of this. I mentioned uh, my audits uh, when I was a state controller. Some of the things I audited, for instance, is how do you use money more efficiently? Uh, so some of you heard about that big bell scandal. Uh, you know, you want it, they were wasting millions of dollars for a low income community where median income was expressed between 29 and $32,000. Uh, we wanted to make sure that those communities are whole so that the parents aren't in financial peril, that they can invest properly, have those additional dollars into schools. Uh, understanding opportunities, right? When I served on the Franchise Tax Board and the Board of Equalization, I worked very aggressively. I think I was the first state elected official, uh, certainly in Southern California, to host an underground economy seminar, right? When you have six to eight billion dollars of economic activity that is not being properly taxed, looking at what we witnessed today, you have some high wage earners, you know, who will take, you know, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars off their California tax schedule for their mortgage interest deduction, and we know it's no longer applicable under the Trump administration, but have no income in California going, how does that happen? Right, so you look at, you know, have they moved and shifted their income to the Cayman Islands mm. or somewhere else? Uh, and then just uh, also within my audits, I audited the state's debt collection practices. And so you have some government agencies that were incredibly inefficient uh, with their practices. Right, so I would update uh, those practices to make sure that we're fu fully collecting those dollars to start to close the gap and do things differently. So, you know, those present vast opportunities. As a state treasurer, uh, and I want to recognize my CalSTRS colleague, Paul, who is a, a terrific expert in uh, municipal finance, I worked very aggressively, you know, to take advantage of the good work uh, that many of us did during that financial crisis, right, I worked to make sure that California's credit rating didn't go into junk status, right? That's why I called out former Governor Schwarzenegger and why I didn't pay the legislature, because we didn't want to fall into technical default like Puerto Rico or Greece, right? Who wants to, who wants to pay 13% you know, to borrow money instead of California today at 4%, right? We want those monies for the University of California. So over a 30-year period of time, or whatever the maturity of that debt is, you know, I will have saved Californians $6 billion. Mm. Nice. So let's turn to housing. Uh, education's hugely important. It's the biggest part of the state budget and, and a major concern of every governor. But housing is something that uh, lots of Californians are concerned about now. It's gotten very expensive. If you're a renter, if you want to buy a home um, and uh, Many Californians feel that um, there might not be a future here because of the cost of housing. Um, and I know that you've had a number of proposals, and there are people who say it's the Environmental Quality Act that has to change in California because it's too hard to build. There are people who say we need rent controls because um, if we don't have rent controls, we're not going to have affordable housing uh, for those who will not be in a position to uh, own a home. What do you think most needs to be done for housing to be less of a crisis in California than it is today? Yeah, I think we have to look at everything on the menu, right? And to your point about uh, Californians choosing to leave, right? Our numbers uh, last year resembled numbers in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, the, when I was uh, listening to one of my economic advisors who's an economist for the California Association of Realtors. Uh, she pointed out that we're back at 28%, where 28% of Californians who move choose to leave our state, mm -hmm. right? That brain drain is staggering, and it has huge impact on California's economic growth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, as the state treasurer, I've worked very aggressively to update uh, the state's uh, fiscal practices, right? 
one of the things I don't like to do, right, coming from immigrant stock, is I don't like wasting money, right? The, uh, you know, my mom used to negotiate going to Dominic's, uh, you know, and saying, you know, this thing was five cents cheaper than, or more expensive than last week, right? You know, can I get that price discount? Uh, so when I see California having the opportunity to access federal tax credits for housing, and we don't fully use them, right? What a lost opportunity, right? And I know some of this is technical to you, right? But it's not tax credit, it's not money, right? At, at the end of the day, it's incredible value. Oh, and I just want to recognize Bob for his great work. And Bob, have you retired? You, you haven't retired yet, you're close to? Yeah, I've retired from working for you. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, for now at least. Right? Did a great yeah. job for, for California. Um, <laughs> so, you know, in my first year, and this is how I govern, I'm very inclusive, right? It was written in the California tax machine. You know, my approach to governance is one of inclusion, right? I want to hear all sides, whether, you know, you think I agree or disagree with you, right? People have very valid perspectives, right? And so as we're trying to describe an elephant, right, the, and you have bright people, they may be great at describing a trunk or, you know, a different, or the tail, uh, but we have to look at it holistically to make sure that we get the best answers. Uh, so we did interested hearings meetings throughout the state of California. Uh, meeting with multiple parties. We put into place the regulations the first year. Mm -hmm. The second year, we increased new and rehabilitated housing by 83% mm -hmm. in the state of California. Now, it's admittedly off a small base, and there's much, much work to be done. But it's an example of being, exercising leadership when so many other people, right, the, the others have chosen or not in a place to address affordable housing to, housing today. I've made it a very important priority to move forward on housing. As another example, uh, I don't know how many of you followed it, um, but the house proposal that was passed, the tax plan, would have eliminated the tax deductibility, and Lenny Shakin said, yeah, of private activity bonds. Private activity bonds finance 66% of the affordable housing in the state of California. Right? It also finances hospitals, schools, airports, right? I led the charge here in the state of California, right? Sometimes when you know more than others, right, you, under, you have an expertise, right? You better stand up and explain it to others, right? So we brought people from different communities to fight back. Now, we lost in the House, but luckily part of the coalition had rela relations, a relationship with the Republican senator out of Utah. They explained the impact to him, so it wasn't included in the Senate plan, right? So that created extraordinary opportunities for us going forward. And then, you know, a reporter asked me, you know, President Trump, because I was in the NARAL debate, so I didn't get to watch President Trump's State of the Union live, right? The uh, president wants to work on infrastructure, right? I said, the president needs better counsel, right? Because, you know, the colleagues, his colleagues, <laughs> his colleagues in the House, right, are acting, right, in, uh, in direct contradiction to what the public is publicly professing, right? So we need, we need to change that. And then, all right, I will, th this is what I, and some of you know also I led the coalition last year that tried to put uh, a $9 billion housing bond, mm -hmm. right? Because when you build affordable housing, I'm sorry I'm getting really technical for all of you guys, right? But part of this is you're all smart and we'll have an education about things that are important. And Sharon understands this because she's in this area, right? When you build affordable housing, there's a federal component, a lot of the projects, federal component, a state component, a local government component. The federal government has been less helpful. The state hasn't gone out for a bond in a while. And then our financial condition was weak, right? So out of the general fund and on bonds, we had less money to support affordable housing. And then local governments during that last financial crisis Right, local governments did not compromise with Governor Brown on redevelopment agencies. Right, they sued him in court. Governor Brown said, because you wouldn't, wouldn't work with me, I'm pulling back the funds from redevelopment agencies. He used that money to pay for the deficit in education that we had built up, or that they had built up. Uh, and so I would bring back uh, redevelopment agencies, because local governments need an economic tool to do that. I would use more money out of the state's general fund for the use of tax credits. Mm -hmm. And I would go back because the $4 billion bond, I guess I can't tell you to vote for it or not because I was trying to say here, right? The, but I would go back, just to give you a sense, I would go back for another bond, right? Because the $4 billion is not enough. 
And what about CEQA and rent control? Yes. Where do, where do you stand okay. on those we need, we need to do a reset on, um, on Costa Hawkins, the, uh, right? The, now, we hear some of the stories. I'm not, I'm not saying a full repeal, right? I would reform it. Uh, now, in some situations in Napa, the con actions were already illegal, right? But we really have people abusing the process, right? The wildfires devastated housing for so many good families. And as they were moving elsewhere or people in place, you had the landlords evicting them, saying that they were going to do conversions or offering it to others, right, with prices that had appreciated, you know, 500 to 4,000 percent, according to some of those newspaper accounts. That needs to be stopped. And then, yes, right, we need to make, move through some of these uh, uh, local processes much quicker than we have today. I would offer a carrots and sticks approach to a lot of this, right? A lot of local communities don't want to build housing because they say, you know, you build housing, it's going to cost us to have another resident, right? And then the expenses are more than the benefits, the revenues that they bring in. So, right, we need to change and mix up the incentives. Thank you. Um, not listed on, as one of your top issues earlier, but if I look on your website, you have a whole section of your website on sexual harassment. Yes. And I feel it would be important to talk to you about that um, since um, as governor, mm -hmm. you would be in a position to provide leadership on an issue which obviously the legislature has been dealing with this year. Uh, we had a, a meeting with legislative leaders last week um, in Sacramento, and that was one of the topics that they discussed um, at length. And I, I'd like to, to get your sense of um, yeah, what the problem is, how you would deal with it. And um, you know, there's so much talk about changing culture. You know, what does that mean to you? Yeah. The, uh, so the courageous uh, and brave victims and survivors have my complete support. Right? I hear them. I believe them. And I'll take action. I'm the only candidate who has put out a plan. Right? As governor, I would implement that plan immediately, and we would follow that plan. Right? So you know, when you have a president right, who boasts of sexual abuse right, in conversations, to Hollywood, to nearby, the Silicon Valley, to the city halls of California, right? We need to make sure that we change the culture. And it has to start at the top. Account How do you do that? Accountability stops at, uh, starts at the top, right? Well, you know, people are looking to that leadership. That's why I have a plan, right? And so our trainings have to be much more inclusive, smarter, up to date, right? The, uh, you know, instead of just this video, right, we need to have best evidence, best practices on counseling, on education. Uh, one of my friends just went through a training, I guess uh, the new one they put in at, for the city of Los Angeles uh, was talk about right, just normal conversations uh, and how they've been updated. A lot of those pra practice, practices and education are, are outdated. Right? We have to create a conducive environment where the victims feel safe and supported as they come forward. Uh, Right, the, a lot of the women in Sacramento are talking about, hey, there's no financial remuneration for access to counseling unless you take this exact step. Right? And they said, we need support earlier than then. Right? We need alternative pathways, right? because if you're working in an area where your boss is complicit in improper activity, right? and so you have a hostile workplace, you, know, you have to have a different avenue that you can take. And so, you know, those are parts of the plan and things that we need to look at uh, to make sure that we change that environment. Can you talk about some of the things that you've done in your leadership role over the last 20 years that might give an indication of what, uh, you know, what, what we might expect um, from you as governor in taking leadership in this area? Yeah, I've tried to change the culture, right? The, uh, we have to get rid of the abuse of privilege and arrogance of power, mm. right? What you have is, you know, you continue bad behavior if you allow the exception, right? If you allow somebody's bad behavior and you don't check it 
you don't stop it, it will repeat itself. Mm -hmm. And so mine is change, change who's making those decisions in part. And I think, you know, we have that old group think. Uh, early on, over a decade ago, uh, or about a decade ago, uh, when I was elected controller and a couple years into it, I tried to change private sector leadership, right? Because CalPERS, CalSTRS owns half to 1% of every major corporation. And so I said, we need more women on corporate boards, right? If you had Harvey's company having more women, you know, I think they would have stood up and said something, right? If you have them in C-suites, if you have them in management positions, right, if employees, and, right, they have people that they can understand, relate, share, building a more inclusive, supportive community. And is that something you can, uh, you can point to examples that you've done as controller or as treasurer? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I've sent letters. It's supported by the Women's Caucus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Betsy Berkmer uh, I, you know, worked with our office, met with uh, the president of NABO, uh, who wanted to have me speak at a conference on these efforts. And then, you know, I'm asking you all, all to join that effort. I'm trying to update it. Uh, Paul's there. He knows, right, next month at CalSTRS. Uh, I pushed uh, about a, a month ago, 30 and 30, right? By the 2019 proxy season, I want 30% of America's corporate boards to be women, and I want 30% of America's corporate boards to be diverse, right? LGBTQ, people of color, different things, right? You want, you want people who have a sense of a greater community and hopefully reflect the values and inclusiveness of what the workers and others need. Um, and your, thank you. In your early statements, you, um, you really emphasized your uh, immigrant roots, and that's something that resonates with uh, a lot of us in California, um, either directly or indirectly. And uh, I think that we would want to know um, what, uh, yeah, what you would do the same or different from what the governor and others in leadership position are doing today related to what's going on with increased federal immigration enforcement um, and um, yeah, efforts around um, particularly undocumented immigrants in yeah. California. As, as, as I shared you know, my story, the, my parents are immigrants uh, and my, my style of governance is one of social inclusion and upward economic mobility. I know how it feels. I know the deep-seated pain of being treated as a second-class citizen, right? My, uh, you know, somebody who could share those stories is my high school classmate, Dave Jones. We grew up in uh, a community south suburbs of Chicago, right? The, uh, I'm south side Irish, if you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the fact that my parents came from Taiwan. The, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, you could relate, right? Because it's generation after generation, right? British, Scottish, Irish, German, Italians. I don't know why we have this pervasive discrimination, right? Just look a couple of generations back. Right? If you're not Native American, your family is immigrants. Right? And so that we would perpetuate this disparate treatment, especially treating people poorly, you know, shouldn't be part of the United States DNA. So what, what, what are you going to do about this? The, uh, right, 2019 and beyond. How, how do you, government what do you by, do? Government by inclusiveness. Uh, we will push back against President Trump. Uh, right, we're engaged in the litigation. Uh, the, as I've done so many times, I will reach out to others to put together a national effort uh, to push back on President Trump on multiple fronts. Uh, you know, I, I go back to my college days when I protested South Africa when I was in law school. The, uh, right, so I, I still like being on the front lines. But also, you know, t when you're in office, uh, you reach out to others. So when they had the Muslim ban, not only was that I at LAX, right, but I reached, sent out a letter to a lot of Asian American and other elected officials to say, let's sign on and push back against President Trump, right, rallying a community. Well, we want all of our communities, but one that uh, we wanted to make sure really, really engage in this community on that because it's part personal, right? They, uh, as I grew up, we were the first Asian family and we faced that discrimination with rocks ugly racial epithets, but 
later on, right, in that community of about 11, 12,000, the Asian population didn't grow, but a lot of the Muslim population grew, right? So when they wanted to build a mosque, right, it, it met with violence. Uh, so, you know, my roots I still see from there, but, you know, we are going to do everything we can to build community a sense. I want California to be that shining state where we recognize our diversity, we demonstrate our values, we're locked in arms and arms, uh, work closely with our hearts so that people who have a different opinion understand, or as my mom used to say, the good people will find the good people, right? And we will stand and overwhelm the people with hatred. And um, in what areas do you think you could find common ground with um, Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. or the Trump administration? <laughs> Take your choice. The, uh, we'll find a lot of common ground. Uh, and uh, we'll work with them, right? The, uh, you know, I always work in a spirit of uh, fairness, mm -hmm. uh, honesty, integrity, uh, and we will push back uh, heroically and as uh, fiercely when we disagree with them, right? But, you know, we have to understand that uh, we have to try to be positive at the outset. You know, I went back, participated with the National Association of State Treasurers earlier last year, and President Trump hadn't re recognized the, uh, the disaster in Orville. And so, you know, we had reached out to Governor Brown's office and said, the, uh, you know, I'm going to be meeting I was with the Deputy White House Chief of Staff for Intergovernmental Affairs, along with other state treasurers. Do you want me to communicate to them, right, you know, the, and pose the query, what are you going to do in regards to Orville? Mm -hmm. Right, so in front of the other state treasurers, you know, I asked the question, right, they said, in fact, that morning they had discussed it, right, so they are, they're, they are on top of the issue, right, so the, I want them to understand that we have strong, powerful principles, we will resist, but we're not, you know, we're, I'm not going to put up a fight on every single issue, right, we will try to be constructive, right, if President Trump wants to work on infrastructure, we'll give them California's best ideas on infrastructure. So speaking of the Oroville Dam and infrastructure, um, Governor Brown has uh, placed a large emphasis on the Delta Tunnels as part of the overall solution to the water um, challenges in California, and he's placed an emphasis on high-speed rail as part of the overall emphasis on transportation challenges and what's needed for California's future. Would you continue with those two large projects, um, or are there other things that are more priorities for you in terms of infrastructure? Uh, so, well, let me give you an overall framework, right? Because people don't talk about infrastructure. They don't think about infrastructure, right? So that's why we have a haphazard approach in many respects. So as the state treasurer, a couple of years ago, I put out a framework to address infrastructure. So as governor, I would first of all have a central inventory of all the state's assets, right? Because right now a lot of our assets are identified in separate silos. Comprehensively, holistically, that does not make sense. The, uh, so, and then, you know, I put out a design, as I pointed out, a framework, right? We want to look at the useful life of those assets, right? Because if you have an Oroville and it has a certain life span, right? And if you exceeded that lifespan, right? We better go in there and make sure that we're checking it, and we're checking it thoroughly. And then we ought to identify a funding source for all of the infrastructure, right? Oftentimes in public finance, as Paul and Bob will tell you, right, you look at beneficial use, you know, as to how you pay for this. And then I wanted to create a center for financial excellence to make sure that taxpayers aren't paying a penny more than we have to, right? Architects, designers, engineers, financial personnel, and others Right, because sometimes a lot of uh, smaller jurisdictions don't get the same uh, financial uh, access and pricing power as l larger jurisdictions. Right, so what we wanted to do is see if we can create pools, right, similarly situated assets, risk profiles, right, covering, so that we can try to drive down costs. Right, if you're uh, if, you know, if, if you're Rohnert Park versus uh, San Jose, right, there, there, there could be some massive differences. So how do we try to drive down those costs for some of the smaller communities? So, you know, that's the first tack I would take in regards to your speci two specific ideas. I, I'm for high-speed rail, 
Uh, but we have to figure out how to pri privately finance it. So I led, I led uh, two delegations to China last year, uh, one with some high-tech executives uh, and government officials, one from Southern California, and then I went a third time separately to talk on healthcare. Uh, and one of the Southern California delegation, I actually invited Jim Frazier, uh, who heads the Assembly Transportation Committee. So we were working and talking to some potential investors who are interested in high-speed rail, right? Because, you know, I want to close that gap, right? You know, we have a, this incredible wealth inequality, and you have here, right, where the Silicon Valley and San Francisco is going to have huge economic challenges in the future, right, unless we do something about housing, right, because it's built out and people are leaving. Uh, so how do we connect affordable housing in this... Uh, in Central Valley, right, over to, especially for that young Latino child who's going to break that entrenched cycle of poverty for that family, go work for Facebook or BI Pharmaceutical, somebody make eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars a year, but otherwise wouldn't take that job, would go off to Ogden, Utah, uh, because of housing prices, right? So that's why, right, we have to have a better design. And for the, uh, for the Delta project, right, it, there is in legislation a pathway. I mm -hmm. think we continue to find, follow that pathway. For me, it hasn't met to the satisfaction in regards to uh, making sure that we have a full environmental review as to quality and supply of water. So, but I don't, I don't stop the process, right, because I think it's really healthy to okay. follow that democratic process so we get all the best information possible. Okay. So um, as a democratic candidate um, for governor, a lot of people are going to be asking you about where you stand on single-payer health care. Mm -hmm. That seems to be um, really a, a big area of contention right now. Um, and uh, with Medi-Cal being the largest health plan, not just the largest public health plan, but the largest health plan in California, uh, what's your overall vision for how do we provide health for Californians, health care? Yeah, not the way we do it today. Um, do you think the system is broken today? The, the system is incredibly inefficient, right? right. And so the, uh, I don't think people get to operate at the highest levels. Uh, so I am a supporter of single payer. Uh, my parents come from a country that has single payer. Uh, but you can do, replicate that model here in the United States of America. You can, you can pick up some examples. Uh, so single payer in Taiwan has 85% approval of the residents, but it has 30% approval by the doctors. Hmm. Right, because the you know, right, our our healthcare professionals get paid more than a lot of other jurisdictions. Right, so right today, where you talk about California uh, and a lot of the providers won't provide the, the essential services because they feel that the medical reimbursement rates are insufficient, inadequate. Right, if you try to drive it down to what other countries are paying, right, the you would have even less mm -hmm. availability of uh, the healthcare professionals in the system. Uh, I'm a supporter of uh, Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All. Hmm. Uh, the, um, but we can't get there immediately, right? It's interesting, right? How long is it going to take? The, uh, it depends on the federal government. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you the steps, right? So you have Delane and Gavin who are for SB 562 all in. The, I'm somewhere in the middle, and you have Antonio who says he supports single payer, but he, the financing mechanisms don't work right now. So it's actually interesting because Antonio is where Gavin was for universal or for, uh, for the healthy San Francisco's in mm -hmm. 2005, right? When Tom Amiano pushed out the plan, Gavin was not supportive, right? And Gavin the, right, was, had the same concerns that Antonio has today, where it says, you know, how are we going to pay for this, right? The, uh, he was concerned about how to pay for this. That's Antonio's concern. So mine is, let's figure out how much we have in the system today, mm -hmm. right? How much from the state? We're very uncertain how much we're going to get from the federal government, right? The, you know, California Hospital Association, just from one reference point, was talking about a couple years ago, right? Uh, you know, $80 billion from the federal government from this pot, $68 million from Medi-Cal. And again, I'm going to get a little bit wonky. I'm sorry, technical You're details. in the right place for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, but we know that, you know, when they, had the, when they had the Medicare expansion for the first three years, you know, the people from 100 to 138% were fully covered, or the state was covered, right? Jerry Brown asked, 
can we only participate for the first three years and not participate afterwards? Right, because the expected cost to California, once the sliding scale started and the state had to make a contribution, was $350 million. Right, that was expected. Now it's over $350 million, right? It's closer to $800 million, right? And we're still sliding. Uh, and so, right, and if you look at the historical rates, right, it stops at 90%, right? Part of that discussion out of Washington, D.C. is do they go to a block grant or do they go to a back, traditionally back to a 50% model, right? So, right, if you do that 50% model and you used to get 68, a chunk of the 68 billion, right, the, how much is that 68 billion gonna drop to, right? So mine is, let's look at how much the state can provide Let's try to get a good sense from the federal government as to how much they'll contribute. And then let's build what we can build, right? We don't have to build a mansion at the beginning. Let's build a starter house with that single payer, right? Of the Obamacare's 10 guaranteed has to be covered, you know, how much of that 10 can we cover and to what degree, right? I'm for universal health care, right? A lot of people in this conversation are mixing single payer and universal health care. Right, they jump back and forth in the debate, listen to it, right, because they're not directly answering the question. I'm for universal health care. We have about 2.9 million Californians who are not insured, over 10 million Californians who are underinsured. That's going to be a significant cost, right? So how much do additional are we going to add to the cost by including the 2.9 million, plus how much is it going to cost in regards to the depth of services? An example of those services, my mom had serious health issues last year. And so the med the doctor prescribed to my mom was like over $3,000. My mom said, I can't cover this. And we said, mom, you gotta take it, right? Because we want you on this earth for a long time. My brother, luckily, uh, he didn't quite get there, right? If uh, some of you are familiar with Taiwan, especially Southern Taiwan, uh, and the generation my mom was raised, right? The, uh, they wanted all their kids to be surgeons, right? And my mom got no surgeons, the, uh, but she got one ophthalmologist, right? The, uh, so he, he was the closest, right? The, but at least he can converse with the doctor, right? And the doctor says she needs to take this. And my mom's concerned about, you know, what it would do to her pocketbook, right? We didn't want her to fall victim like so many Americans where healthcare costs drives you into bankruptcy. And so luckily my brother has good financial wherewithal and said, you know, mom, I will cover it. Don't worry about it, right? You get whatever you need so that you can stay on this earth as long as God permits you to do so. Um, so, right, under this whole thing, uh, design of single payer, is, is that med that's not covered under Medicare, would that be co covered under California single payer and universal health care coverage? The answer is we don't know. Right? And I think we have to be honest and straightforward with the people of California. Is that coverage provided or not co covered? Right? Because that has to go into the financial calculations. We can do this, right? but we have, to, we, have to, we have to plan this and design this properly. We're going to take some questions from the audience. And while the members of the audience are thinking about their question, and I hope there'll be short questions so we can get several of them in, I want you to tell us what is the most important quality in a word, maybe, uh, for the governor of California. I'll, I'll use Warren Buffett's uh, thing, integrity. Hmm. Integrity. Mm -hmm. And um, while uh, we're thinking a little bit more, um, can you, in, a, in really short order, tell us why it is you're running for governor? Uh, I feel so blessed. Uh, to live in this state, right? I'm also an immigrant, right? I chose after coming here, uh, from graduating from school, because I believe California provided the best opportunities. Okay. I love the diversity, right? The, I, you know, I loved my friends, right? But I, there wasn't a lot of diversity where I grew up, right? The, and so in so many respects, you feel alone, right? People don't understand your experience. They don't understand your background. You don't get to share, share it with others as much. I mean, you hear this story from all immigrants, but it was sort of the, uh, so I was traumatized since first grade. The, uh, 
right? I would bring a bento box, right? And that's Japanese, right? But again, my parents are from Taiwan, but my parents grew up during Japanese occupation. Hmm. And so I just have rice, right? And that silver bento box. And my mom would make the beef and broccoli or fish. And I was, I just did not want to go to lunch, right? <laughs> because when you're going to open it, right, you knew everybody in the lunchroom was going to say, ooh, right? The, uh, right? But today, right, kids like that, mm -hmm. right? It's like you trade it, I want that, yeah, right? That's cool. I tell my mom, <laughs> right, it's like, instead of going out and paying 15 bucks or something like that, it's like, mom, can you make me one of those? She goes, she goes you wanted fried chicken and spaghetti and meatballs, right? She started adjusting the diet, not for my dad, because he wanted rice every day, right? He goes, you wanted the American food, I figured out it was a lot easier to make, I'm gonna stick with the American food. <laughs> All this talk about food's making me hungry. And pretty soon we're going to have cookies and dessert, but let's take a few questions. There was one right here. So, yeah. And then the, uh, if I could ask, hey, Ruben, the, uh, since I know you're, you're, if you're first. No, the, right over oh, here. So I, I ask for your name and your dream, right? Yeah. As I did last time. Okay. Oh, my name and my dream? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Christian. My dream is to, I don't know, run MSNBC. Ah. <laughs> Uh, so, quick question, Treasurer Chung. So, um, one of the things that hasn't been talked about in this campaign, uh, which com could completely decimate California over the next ten years, is the 2020 census. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, as you probably know, you know, there's no leader; it's underfunded. Uh, and now, the Department of Justice wants to add a question on citizenship, um, which you know, many undocumented families, understandably, like, would not want to fill out and answer that question. Um, so, I'm wondering, you know, is this something that's on your radar? Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, like, what would you do? as governor of California to ensure a fair and accurate count for California. Good question. Yeah, the 2020 census, I think, is the, uh, another example of President Trump's uh, revenge against the state of California, right? The, uh, you know, by asking immigration status, uh, you know, it is gonna scare away a lot of immigrants from participating in the count, right? An undercount in California is estimated to be able to cost us $750 billion over the next decade uh, and a loss of a congressional seat. Um, I strongly support, um, uh, I almost said President Brown, uh, Governor Brown's, uh, <laughs> maybe go, Governor Brown's effort. Uh, I think he was talking about putting in $40 million uh, for outreach for the census, right? The, uh, and we're gonna have to send a powerful signal that we're gonna protect our, our residents here. You have to participate in this. Uh, um, and so, yeah, we would aggressively go forward uh, to make sure that Question everybody- Question on this side is counted. Yes. Thank, my name is Londa Jose. Thank you for your commitment to, to education. Your dream? My dream, my dream is that um, everyone in California is housed. That's my dream. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question about higher education because there's been a lot of uh, commentary around free college and a number of candidates are on the record to support the first year of free college. And that's great, some are supporting too. My question really though is about debt-free college because one of the things that this commitment to free college does is it kind of obscures the real issue, which is that the cost drivers of college are not really tuition. Mm -hmm. It's about housing, it's about food, it's about transportation. And I'm wondering what your position is around debt-free college. So the answer is uh, yes, I went ahead in that direction. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you look at my education platform, I said, you know, they should get access to two free, two free years of uh, community college, right? And I know it's not, I'm just at a, a point in your larger question, right? The, uh, um, part of this is why I push so aggressively for financial responsibility. Uh, you know, why I challenged Governor Schwarzenegger and why I didn't pay the legislature is the students, amongst others, uh, pay when they don't get the finances correct, right? That last 10 year period around that last recession, right, we increase, not we, the respective entity, fees on community college students by 130%, right? Over the last 34 years, they increase fees on community college students by 800%. UC support, Cal State support from state government has dropped dramatically. So they increased tuition and fees by over 113% that 10 year period around that last recession. Uh, and so mine is, and right, if you listen to me publicly, right, I would scale up uh, one, I visit university professors, uh, not professors, presidents, right? And I say this, I will make a contribution to your university, uh, not much, I'm a public servant, I don't take outside income, right? I wanna keep, prevent a conflict of interest, 
right? I would encourage other candidates to fully disclose who's investing in your projects, uh, right, and who's doing business at your, with your projects. Um, and I said, I will make a contribution. Do you want to go to tuition assistance, uh, students who are food insecure, or students who are housing insecure, right? So the additional funding that we provide would look at comprehensively what they need, right? Because you have to have a greater approach. And then I'm for personalized and targeted strategies. So whether it's the students or the homeless or others. So I visited uh, about two and a half weeks ago Imperial Valley College uh, down on the border, right? And what I loved uh, as I was touring is, and I did got the press uh, briefing, is that they identify who's homeless. They identify whose families have struggle, right? So they have targeted strategies. I think they said they had like 87 homeless kids, right? So they make sure that they get the food for them, right? And they'll ask about family circumstance, right? So, you know, I don't know if this is a specific example or if they're just using it as an example. They said, you know, if somebody has like nine members of their family who don't have adequate meals, they will prepare the meals for nine of them in their family, right? So I want more of that really targeted strategies for all those students, right? And frankly, when I mentioned financial counselors back in junior high school or high school, that's what I'm trying to do. Early on, you need to do the financial planning. So, right, even before college, right, you're building all that out, right? That's why as state treasurer today, I've aggressively tried to create new programs to help California families participate in ScholarShare 529, right? It's the savings program. Right, I changed the way we directed money. Right in the old days, you know, the company that the state had hired used to do traditional marketing. Right, I wanted to do marketing differently. Right, I would have competitions bet between schools. Right, instead of thirty thousand dollars marketing doing it in a newspaper, I said, you know, whichever school comes up with the gets the greatest school participation, you know, in this contest. Right, we will dedicate thirty thousand dollars to that school so that for a science lab, or you know, for after school activities or other types of things. Uh, you know, even down to little things, right? If you go to, you know, Toys R Us, if you see that ScholarShare gift card, that, I was the first, my office, I thank my staff, right? They give credit where due. My staff came up with that idea, right? Instead of, you know, just spending money on all these other things, let's invest in a child's education. And let's, as you're walking out the counter, right, it's right there so you can think about it, right? If it's in front of you, it's in mind. So um, unfortunately, we're out of time. But I, I, I need to ask you, for I think for all of us, if, if you became governor, what kind of governor would you be? Aspirational. Aspirational. What does that mean to you? Aspirational. Uh, I want everybody to understand that if, you're, if anything special, your dream's going to come true, it's California, right? Before, nobody used to challenge that, right? You know, the, and the, uh, I want to give credit, right, because I don't want to say I stepped on somebody's line. Antonio said he said this once, right? So, right, you know, you only talked about, when you talk about American dreams, you talk about the American dream and the California dream, right? I want everybody, when you start talking about it, when you understand the dream, it is California. The kids aren't going to Seattle. The kids aren't going to Austin, Texas. The businesses aren't leaving, right? If you want anything magical to happen, it happens here. Hmm. Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs> I wanna thank Chet for being part of our program today. Uh, Treasurer Chung, always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you for being here today and best of luck. Uh, everybody who's joined us, um, thank you so much for, for taking the time to be part of this program today. Our 2018 uh, sponsors of our events, uh, we wouldn't be having these meetings and free lunches without you, so thanks for your support. And um, I hope you can stay and socialize a, a little bit and, and meet people informally. I know that there were a lot of questions we didn't get to, and there's coffee and dessert outside, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks you for joining us. If you have any hard us. questions, ask Donna Lenny. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh,